Please be seated. Good morning, everyone. We are on the record to begin uh, day two. We're in the presence of the jury. Mr. Behema is present along with the attorneys of record. Uh, prior to the state calling their first witness uh, this morning, uh, do we have further record we need to make regarding exhibits? We do, Judge. Um, as you know, we've provided uh, both the court and the defense with a copy of our exhibit list. And uh, yesterday we moved in several uh, exhibits. Uh, at this time, we would move in uh, by agreement exhibit, now exhibits 11. Well, let me just do it this way. We'll move in a total of exhibits one through 52 inclusive. I know some of those have already been admitted, but just for ease of the record here. Uh, by agreement, we have, uh, we would offer now state's exhibits one through 52 inclusive that are on our list. Uh, I've talked to Mr. Freeze prior to uh, starting court this morning, and I believe that he is in agreement to stipulate to those at this time. Thank you, Mr. Brown. Uh, Mr. Freeze, one through 52 of the state, is that agreeable? It is. Uh, at this point in time, uh, state's exhibits one through 52 are admitted into evidence. With that then, uh, the state may call its next witness. The state calls Deputy Steve Kivy. Mr. Kivy, can you step over here real quick? I'll swear you. Do you swear or affirm the testimony about to give will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth to help you out? Yes. Okay. See it over there if you would. Don't get too close. Speak up. Right. Mr. Claver, you may proceed when you're ready. Thank you, Your Honor. Would you state and spell your name, please? Steve Kivy. K I V as in Victor I. And who is your employer? Powershee County Sheriff's Office. And what do you do for the sheriff's office? I'm a deputy sheriff currently assigned to investigations. How long have you held that position? I've been with uh, Powershee County for over 16 years and I've been assigned as an investigator for over eight. And do you have other law enforcement experience? Uh, yes, I was a police officer in Iowa City for eight years. And can you describe your training and experience as it pertains to law enforcement? I graduated in 1996 from Indian Hills Community College with an associate degree in criminal justice and a bachelor's degree in political science. Uh, January of 1997, I was hired by the Iowa City Police Department, uh, began the academy a few days later, graduated in April, uh, went through the field training process, completed that successfully, and for the next seven and a half years, worked in the patrol division. Are you a certified peace officer in the state of Iowa? Yes. In Deputy Kivy, on July 19th, 2018, did you receive a call about a missing person? Yes. Can you describe that call, please? Uh, Sheriff Kriegel called me at home. It was about 9.30 p.m. and told me that a uh, 20-year-old female from Brooklyn named Molly Tibbetts had been missing and that Deputy Matt Simpson had been following up on that and investigating for the last few hours. And what did you do in response to that call? Um, I went down to the sheriff's office and with intentions of trying to locate the phone or do something, but um, after talking to Deputy Simpson, um, that had already been done unsuccessfully. Um, I was told that the, uh, search, um, a search effort had been organized for first thing in the morning and that I was supposed to start working on this the very next morning. When you talk about the phone, what exactly are you referring to? Uh, we were gonna, I, I thought we could ping the phone, try to locate the phone in, a, in an effort to, to find Molly. And whose phone were you? Molly Tibbetts. Do you know where Molly Tibbetts was staying on the evening of July 18th? Yes, she was staying at 622 West Des Moines Street in Brooklyn. And whose residence was that? That's the residence of Blake and Allie Jack and uh, Dalton Jack, Molly's boyfriend, would stay there at that residence also when he was in town, when he wasn't on the road working. Did you go to that residence at any point in time? Yes. Uh, the next day, which would have been July 20th, um, 
the first thing I did is went to the sheriff's office and tried to start organizing this investigation, gathering as much information. I knew that uh, um, uh, search efforts were being organized in Brooklyn. Um, so I was at the sheriff's office for, I don't know, a short time. And then maybe around 9.30 or 10 in the morning, I went to 622 West Des Moines where I met um, DCI agent Trent Valletta. And you're the investigator for the Powashee County Sheriff's Office? Yes. And so would you be the person responsible for um, heading this search when it initially began? Uh, yeah, somewhat. Um, it, we, the Friday kind of turned into, I mean, we had search, we had search effort, and then we had kind of an investigation angle to it too. Um, I was more involved in like interviewing like Blake and Allie and, and Trent Valletta and I walked through the home. Um, I did end up searching though. Did you find anything of interest during that search? Not that morning, no. And during the search of the home, uh, was there any indication found as to where Molly may have gone? Well, Deputy Simpson had relayed to me that um, that Thursday night, the 19th, he had gone through the home at 622 West Des Moines, and he had also talked to uh, Molly's mother, Laura, and he had gone to their house at 114 Bear Drive in Brooklyn, and they noticed that her running shoes were gone, um, and that Blake had also told uh, Matt Simpson that the dogs were in the basement. So those two, those two things together indicated that she had probably gone for a run. And did you learn during the course of your investigation um, Molly's routine concerning her runs? Yes. And what did you learn? We learned that she uh, liked to jog at night or in the evening, late afternoon, and that her routes would vary but that one of her routes would be 385th Avenue that, that runs east out of Brooklyn. And Deputy Kibbe, were there any other agencies involved in the investigation or search for Molly Tibbetts? Yes, uh, the very first day, the July 20th, uh, we had um, several law enforcement agencies, um, our agency, uh, we had assistance from uh, Jasper County, uh, the State Patrol, DCI, I'm probably missing somebody, but um, we also had numerous volunteer firefighters, uh, community members who were out searching um, road ditches, um, um, rural areas, fields. Um, Deputy Kibbe, can you tell me what a canvas is? Yeah, Canvas is, um, is a, I guess it would be an investigative technique that, that we employed um, during this time where we basically, we went door to door and I believe, I believe um, every residence in Brooklyn trying to ascertain who lives there, um, who, who might have been visiting at the time that we believe she disappeared, um, any vehicles associated with the residence and any video that they might have. <coughs> Is that, is that something that was expanded beyond the city limits? Yes. Uh, that, um, that technique was uh, law enforcement related. We had other people searching fields and volunteers searching fields, but um, we, also, we also went door to door to um, farm residences, rural residences, and we focused our search effort um, in the rural areas. I would say um, basically in the, uh, I would say, generally the, the southeastern quarter of our county. Can you tell me approximately how long that process lasted? Uh, at least a month. Did you discover any evidence uh, indicating where Molly may have gone during the course of your canvas? Uh, we, we had some initial information regarding her cell phone that that led us to focus our efforts in that area. Mm -hmm. 
Deputy, what was the significance to the search on the southeast part of the county? Um, we had uh, we had information from uh, an FBI analyst who did some research on her cell phone that that led us to believe that the last location of her cell phone was in that area. Of Molly Tibbetts' cell yes. phone. During the course of the investigation, was any uh, any uh, surveillance video obtained? Yes. And from what sources was that obtained? Uh, we had video from numerous sources. Um, the one that that um, was useful to us came from 616 West Des Moines Street, a residence in Brooklyn. Whose residence was that? Logan Collins. What was significant about that video? Uh, we had a team of law enforcement officers mm -hmm. reviewing video from all kinds of places. Um, in that particular video, uh, the officers reviewing that picked up on a black Chevy Malibu that was seen in that area. And I'll, I'll back up a little bit. Um, 616 East Des Moines Street, it's kind of on the, on the eastern side of Brooklyn. Um, and we believe that um, we believe that uh, Molly Tibbetts have been jogging in that area, and through their review of that video, uh, they were able to ascertain that 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 particular vehicle would have had to have been in the area when Molly Tibbetts was jogging through, and most likely would have seen her. He was just kind of driving around. And were you aware of Christina Stewart's report? of seeing Molly? Yes. And is that how you knew the general location of Molly's run? Yes. And I want to clarify one thing, Deputy Kivy. On Logan Collins' residence, was that on East Des Moines Street? Yes. Did I say West? You Sorry. Did. Yeah, East. Did you actually view that video from Collins' residence? Some of it. I didn't review the whole thing. I saw the pertinent clips but I didn't see the whole thing. No. And what were the pertinent clips? Of the the vehicle traveling around that area, circling around, just kind of lingering in the area for a while. You saw the vit or the vehicle on the video? Yes. Can you describe the vehicle for me please? It was a black Chevy Malibu. Um, Initially, when that when that information was passed on um, from the from the officers reviewing the video, it was described as a black Chevy Malibu, model year 2008 to 2012, with chrome um, mirror covers and chrome door handles. So that's kind of what we were looking for. Um, I remember seeing the clips. I don't think it was until the next day. That or later that I saw the clips, but that's the kind of vehicle that I was looking for. Do you recall the date that the vehicle, uh, the Chevy Malibu, was identified as a vehicle of interest? Yes. When was that date? August 16th. Or I'm sorry, it was identified on video August 15th. And when did you learn about the vehicle? That day. I want to direct your attention to the following day, August 16th, 2018. And on that date, did you encounter a black Chevy Malibu? Yes. Can you describe that encounter for me? Um, <clears throat> yeah, I was driving north on Highway 63 in, um, in my um, county vehicle. It was a dark blue Dodge Durango. I was driving north on Highway 63, and I was going underneath the Interstate 80 overpass. And as I as I went under the overpass, I saw a black Chevy Malibu with chrome mirror covers um, at the stop sign at the be the westbound off ramp. And I it caught my eye, and um, I I drove past it, and then I pulled over on the shoulder to see where it was going to go because I wanted to identify that vehicle and driver. And had you been looking for black Chevy Malibus at that point? Yes. 
Did you follow the vehicle? I did. The vehicle turned north onto Highway 63, so it would have driven past me, and I caught the license plate as it did. Um, I ran it through our dispatch center, and I began to follow the Malibu north on Highway 63. I learned that the vehicle was registered to a female from Tama, and as we drove into Malcolm, which is m m less less than a mile from Interstate 80, um, it, the vehicle turned west onto 2nd Street, and so I followed it, and then it turned north into an alley, and I lost sight of it for a second, but I, as I turned north into the alley, I saw that it was parked, so I parked in the alley, I got out, and the driver was already out of the vehicle, so I said, hey, can I talk to you for a second? And he turned around and um, I tried to communicate with him. It became pretty obvious quickly that he didn't speak English, um, but there happened to be some el older gentleman in a yard nearby that walked over and said he could help us communicate. And Deputy Kibbe, you said you ran the plate of that vehicle. Is that right? Yes. Do you recall what that license plate number was? Yes, it was uh, D. David K. King P. Paul 055. And the registered owner of that vehicle, was that R. Lee Lorenzana? Yes. Were you able to identify the driver of the Malibu? Yes. I asked him uh, if he had any, any identification. He showed me a document as a, a birth certificate that gave his name as uh, Christian Bejina Rivera and his birth date. I asked him, I asked him is, is this you? And he said yes. Did you see the driver of that vehicle in the courtroom today? Yes. Where is he sitting? Uh, is at the defendant table with uh, looks like a light blue button-down collared shirt and the uh, headphones on. Were you able to find any other information, find out any other information about the defendant uh, when you spoke with him that day? Yes. Uh, I asked him where he worked. He told me he worked at Yeraby Farms and had for about the past four years. Uh, he gave me a cell phone number. Uh, I asked him uh, how often he goes into Brooklyn. He goes in occasionally. Uh, he said he has some friends uh, in town that he goes to visit sometimes. Um, he gave me his, his uh, what would be his common route from his residence to town. And when I first when I first asked him what his address was, he said it was I believe it was 1840 400th Avenue, which would be Yerby Farms where he works. Um, later we would learn that he he lived on a property owned by Yerby Farms, but it was on 200th I think 21 um, 40 to 41 something um, 200th. So when he tried to describe to me, he said I take the gravel to the pavement. So when I was imagining him leaving Yerby Farms, I, th I thought, well, he must take like 190th to Old Six as a pavement and into Brooklyn. But later, when we realized that he that, um, he actually lived at a different location um, on 200th, it made more sense to me when he said I take the gravel to the pavement that he would take 200th Street north to 385th and go into town on 385th, which is paved all the way from Brooklyn to 200th. Deputy, if that makes sense. Fifth was the road that uh, Molly was last seen on. Is that right? Yes. What is Yerby Farms? It's a dairy farm just outside of Brooklyn, a few miles. Are you familiar with its location? Yes. Deputy Kimmy, I'd like to show you Exhibit 2. It should pop up on the screen in front of you in a moment. <coughs> Are you familiar with this map? Yes. And what is it? That's this? a map of Powershe County. And could you describe where Yerby Farms is located on this map? Uh, yeah, uh, roughly, let's see. Um, 
Yerby Farms would be rough located Yeah, right about where that arrow is, actually, roughly. That, that arrow is an accurate depiction yeah. of where Yerby yes. Farms is? Did you take photographs uh, during your encounter yes. with the driver? Yes. What photographs did you take? I took one of uh, Mr. Rivera and I took a few of his car. I'd like to direct your attention to Exhibit 22. Are you familiar with this image? Yes, I took that picture. And what's depicted? That's the vehicle that I encountered in uh, Malcolm. The vehicle that caught your attention? Yes. Driven by Mr. Christian Bahina Rivera? Yes. When did you take that picture? Uh, August 16th. Where was the picture taken? Uh, in Malcolm, I believe it was to the rear of 205 Clay Street in Malcolm, in an alley behind the residence. I'd like to move to exhibit 23. What is this picture? It's a picture of Mr. Rivera. Did you take that picture? Yes. When did you take it? That day, August 16th. And where was it taken? Uh, same location. Same time? Yes. And Deputy Kid, I've got a couple more exhibits for you. I'd like to move to 38 and 39. Are you familiar with this image? Yes. What is it? That's a picture of the same car and that's in our Sally Port at the Sheriff's Office in the garage area. And does this photograph capture the license plate of that vehicle? Yes. Is it the same license plate number that you encountered on August 16th, 2018? Yes. I'd like to move to 40 and 41. What is depicted in these images? Uh, the same car in our Sally Port garage area. Are there any distinguishing features captured in this image? The, I would say the chrome mirror covers and the chrome door handles and the license plate. Is this the same car you encountered on August 16, 2018? Yes. Then I'd like to move to Exhibit 42. And what is this, Deputy Kibbe? Uh, it's a kind of a closer up picture of the same car. It appears to be focused on the chrome mirror. Did you ask the defendant about Molly Tibbetts when yep. you encountered him on August 16th? Yes. And what was his response? He said he had heard that there was a girl missing from Brooklyn but didn't have any knowledge that would be useful to us. Deputy Kibbe, what were you wearing on August 16th, 2018 when you encountered the defendant? I was wearing uh, a black short sleeve polo with a gold 
uh, Powershee County Sheriff Star sewn onto it, uh, khaki pants with a uh, with um, sidearm and my uh, badge affixed to my belt, um, and black boots. Was it apparent that you were a law enforcement officer by your dress? I would assume so. Did you identify yourself to the defendant as a law enforcement officer? I did. I said my name is Steve Kivian with the Powershee County Sheriff's Office. Did you make an arrest at that point? No. And how did you end the encounter with the defendant? Uh, probably just said thanks for your time and he walked off and I got in my car. Did you do anything subsequent to that encounter, report it to anyone, uh, anything of that nature? I did. What did you do? Uh, I made a phone call. I don't remember who it was to. told him about the encounter. Um, I don't remember if I sent the pictures that day. I remember showing pictures to people the next day. Thank you, Deputy. Can we have no further questions for you at this time? Defense may cross-examine. Deputy Kibbe, I'll kind of want to work backwards. We'll start with the interaction with uh, Mr. Behena on the, the 16th, right? Yes. Of August. When you talked to him that day, describe his demeanor, please. He was, seemed calm and not nervous and... He was polite? Yes. He answered all your questions? He did. Produced all information you requested of him? He did. Did you get the opportunity to look about his car and uh, see if you could find anything of evidentiary value. I didn't actually search his car. Uh, I, I looked inside through the windows while he was in his glove box getting his document that he produced. Did you notice anything unusual about the inside of his car? No. Okay. And he told you where he worked and he told you where he lived, correct? Yes. yes. Um, up to that point uh, on August 16th where he told you where he worked and told you where he lived, had you received any information concerning those locations being suspicious in the disappearance of Molly Tibbetts? As far as, uh, I'm sorry, where he worked, you said? Yes. No. Had you received any tips or any, any um, intelligence that Molly Tibbetts may have been abducted by an individual named Christian Bahena? No. Had you received any tips or intelligence that the likely suspect was Hispanic? No. You were involved in this investigation every day, correct? Yes. Were there briefings every day? Yes. And were you involved in briefings with both the DCI and the FBI? Yes. And the FBI utilized uh, vast resources, didn't they? Yes. That included agents from Washington, D.C., right? Yes. And some of these agents were um, agents from the Behavioral Analysis Unit, right? I, I, I'm not sure about that. Okay. Did any of these briefings that you were involved in uh, include briefings from the FBI as to what kind of individual you're likely looking for? I don't believe so, no. Okay. The southeast corner of the county, define that for me. Very rural. Um, very rural? Very rural, yeah. Okay, but what would be the, the draw me a, a mental picture. Where's the top end, where's the bottom end and the east and west corners? We pull the map up, I could show you. Um, or you just want me to describe it to you? Just describe it to me. Um, Powershee County is, is very rural. Um, Interstate 80 goes east and west right through the middle of the county. Um, Brooklyn is right along Interstate 80, maybe just to the east of center. Um, so I would say, I mean, it's if you go straight south of Brooklyn, if you can imagine that, that uh, south, southeastern quadrant, um, Interstate 80 runs right through there. Um, Highway 21 runs straight south from Interstate 80. I would say right straight through that quadrant, basically. Um, there's a couple little towns down there, uh, Deep River and Guernsey. I guess, does that answer your question? So you're looking in the, the, the Deep River, Guernsey area? Yeah. Yeah, in that area, in that kind of cone shape, I guess. Is that the uh, area where uh, Molly was ultimately found? Yes. And the reason that area was focused on was because uh, that was where her cell phone last pinged, right? That was where, 
kind of a technical term. Um, that's where we were told that the, there was some, that the um, phone powered off or that was the last known location of the phone. Okay. And that's what led you to an individual named Wayne Cheney? Yes. Because his uh, home was near there. Yes. Um, and Mr. Cheney, did you uh, canvas or search his area? Uh, yes. And what was the connection or the um, attraction to Mr. Cheney as someone of interest? Basically, Wayne Cheney uh, lived in the area, or does as far as I know still. Um, he'd had a kind of history of um, no contact order violations, um, just kind of a, a reputation as being a little different around women, I guess, to put it. Um, all we knew in those first days were that was where her phone was. We didn't have any anything solid leading to anybody. We were... Um, Did you or any other law enforcement, to your knowledge, have any tips regarding Wayne Cheney and his involvement in this investigation? That's possible, but I, I, I couldn't tell you for sure. Would you agree with me that there, if there were a tip involving someone who had a history of violence against women uh, or perhaps being sexually deviant mm -hmm. uh, in that quadrant of the county, that'd mm -hmm. be something law enforcement would want to follow up on? Yes. And tell me why that, that is. Well, we had a missing 20-year-old um, under suspicious circumstances. Um, unlike her, we also learned through um, that uh, FBI phone analysis that she was jogging um, and witness test or uh, eyewitness um, accounts that she had been jogging on 385th Avenue. Um, she had her phone with her. Um, there was some kind of what they called event um, at a certain at a certain point um, along 385th Avenue, and all of a sudden her phone is traveling like 55 or 60 miles an hour south down a gravel road, and then it just shuts off in the middle of nowhere. Wait, um, <coughs> excuse me, Wayne Cheney lived on 470th Avenue, correct? Yes. And Molly's body was found on 460th Avenue, correct? Yes. So basically Wayne Cheney lived about a mile south of where uh, Molly's body was found and perhaps I think a little bit to the west, right? Yes, that's right. Now, um, were you involved in any canvassing of 460th Avenue? Yes. Did you talk to the uh, the residents up and down 460th Avenue? Yes. Did you talk to anybody who resided in the 2400 block of 460th Avenue? I don't believe I did. I don't. Somebody was prob somebody probably did, but I don't recall going that far personally. Would it be important in your training, education, and experience to talk to the people who? lived immediately in the area where Molly's body was found? Yes. And why is that? I'm sorry? Why is that? Well, we, we would want to know if they saw anything or had any information that would be useful, saw anything suspicious around that time. Do you know whose property Molly's body was found on? Uh, I believe the last name is Bear. Okay. Do you know who owns the property immediately adjacent to the west? of Molly's body? I don't. If I gave you the name Ron Pexa, would that jog your memory? To the, immediately to the west? Correct. Yes. I did, I did go there. I remember talking to him. You did talk to Ron Pexa? Yes. And why did you talk to Mr. Pexa? I uh, believe we had some information come in about him. Um, I don't recall specifically what it was. I went there with a couple of other agents and we talked to him for I don't know, a half hour. Was that recorded? <coughs> not that I know of. Was a report made of that? Uh, not by me. Did Mr. Pexa tell you he was a law enforcement officer? Mm, yes. Or okay. retired or part-time or I don't remember. Okay. And the information you received about Mr. Pexa, please tell me what it was. Uh, I, I don't remember where it came from. I don't remember. Did the report involve him being sexually violent in the past? 
it could have. I don't. I don't really remember. Was this before or after Molly was found dead? That was before. Okay, and he lived approximately less than a quarter mile from where her body was found. I, I, I'm not sure about the distance, but nearby. If his address is 2410 460th Avenue. That sounds about right. That's about where her body would have been found. Yeah, that could be accurate, yeah. And if Mr. Pexa, uh, if, I'm assuming that if he had a history of violence against women, that's something you would have followed up on? Yes. You recall who the agents were you went there with? I believe it, I think it was Agent Valletta from the DCI and I think Agent Potras from the FBI. Okay. And you'd agree with me that an investigation of this magnitude that something as important as investigating and talking to someone who has the allegations against them like Mr. Pexa, those would be documented. When you think? I would think. Yeah, I don't know. I, I didn't. You weren't the investigating officer, so you necessarily wouldn't do it, right? I didn't, you know, I didn't, uh, I, don't, I don't think I had anything on Mr. Pexa. Okay. But you had a lot on Mr. Cheney. Not really. I mean, he was, he was uh, interviewed um, at least once that I know of, um, and I know he was looked at very closely. Okay. He was um, very closely. He was looked at right. um, and eventually cleared. Okay. He was interviewed at least twice, right? I think so. His property was searched, right? I believe so. And to your recollection, Ron Pexa, his property was, or wasn't searched, was it? I, I believe we did. And can you tell me what that property search entailed? Uh, I, we were in his house. Um, we walked through some outbuildings. Was that a uh, quarter mile stretch between where Molly's body was ultimately found and Mr. Pex's house? Was that searched by volunteers? Uh, it could have been. I know we didn't do it that day. Was Mr. Pex ever brought into the fire department and officially interviewed? Not that I know of. Okay. Do you know if he denied any type of sexual deviance or violence against women? I don't remember him being asked that specifically, but it, it's possible. Okay. In response to Mr. Claver's question, um, you seem to opine that where Mr. Bahena was living, he would have traveled north on 200th Street and then went in 385th to get to Brooklyn, right? Right. 200th Street, if I understand it correctly, goes straight north, correct? Yes. And as you go straight north a couple miles, um, well, first of all, is it north or south of Interstate 80? His residence? Yes. Just north. Okay. You go north on 200th Street, he told you he gets to the blacktop and then turns, right? Right. Correct. Yeah, so you turn left actually to right. get to Brooklyn. Correct. So 385th is not the first blacktop you hit, right? No. So you hit old Highway 6 first. Right. You take yes. Highway 6 left, and that takes you into Brooklyn too. Yes, it could. So he never clarified whether he took old Highway 6 or kept going north to 385th and took the blacktop, right? That's right. So the idea that he shot across Old Highway 6, kept going north, hmm. and then took 385th in is mere speculation. That, yeah, that was my opinion. But yeah. he didn't give me the correct address, his correct address when I asked him the first time either. I'd only learned of his actual address later. Okay. Uh, and again, he spoke very little English. Right, that's right. And was he able to give you anything with his correct address on it? <coughs> Not that day I talked to him. Okay. Um, but he's able to give you the address of where he worked. That's right. Um, so the, your testimony to the jury that he just left out the fact that there was a blacktop he would cross first, 
uh, you just opine that he blew past the first blacktop, went to the second one, which just happens to be the one where Molly Tibbetts was running, right? Right. That's 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 what I thought after we realized what his actual address was. Okay. And and that fits the narrative because that's where she was running the day she it's was certainly a possibility. Yeah. But there's no evidence that you can provide that's what he did. No. Okay. And when you take old highway six, if the first blacked up, that takes you right into downtown where all the business is done, right? Uh, it takes you to the, the the south end of Brooklyn. You'd have to turn and go into town, but when you turn to go into town, you go over a little bridge. Mm -hmm. and yes. Downtown's right there, right? That's right. That's where the grocery store is, right? That's right. That's where the gas stations are, right? Yes. That's where anything of commerce that you would do is, right? That's right. Is that where the trailer park is too? Yes. When you come in 385th Street, that's the northern edge of town, right? Yeah, mid, yeah, midway, yeah. That's more of the, the residential area, right? Yes. And did Mr. Behena uh, tell you that he would go into Brooklyn on the residential side of town? I don't remember if he said that specifically. I know he told me that he would go, he had friends to visit, or he would go into town occasionally. On the 20th, as part of your investigation into this case, you also uh, were just gathering information in general, right? I'm sorry? On the 20th, part of your job was just gathering as much information as you could, right? On what date? The 20th of uh, July. Yes. And part of that gathering of information was... Uh, interviewing Dalton Jack. Oh, on July 20th, yes, yes. And was your interview the first real interview that uh, Mr. Jack had to undergo? Uh, I, believe he, I believe he talked to Deputy Simpson the night before. Okay. But as far as uh, an in-depth type interview, a true interview, not just a fact-gathering interview that Deputy Simpson did, yours was the first one? Mine was the very next one, yes. Okay. Now, um, do you recall uh, the recitation of activities, what Mr. Jack said to you about his activities? Objection, hearsay. Could you read the question, back please? <clears throat> Now, do you recall the recitation of activities, what Mr. Jack said to you about his activity? Sustained. As part of collecting information and to further your investigation, you took statements from Mr. Jack, correct? Yes. And that was to further your investigation, Mr. No, Deputy Kibbe, right? Right? Yes. And the statements you took from Mr. Jack were meant to guide you in your next step in the investigation, correct? Yes. And did Mr. Jack give you statements that helped guide you in your investigation? Yes. What was the purpose in investigating or talking to Mr. Jack? To gain more information on Molly Tibbetts, her habits, uh, basically start building what we call a victimology. What is a victimology? Like a just a background, personal history of a, of a victim, um, habits, preferences, um, personal characteristics, things of that nature. Okay. He told you that um, the night that Molly was abducted, the 18th, that he was living the hotel life, right? Yes. Objection, hearsay. Overruled. Go ahead. He told you he was hanging with friends that night, right? I don't know if he told me he was hanging with friends. He told me he was at the hotel. He was in Dubuque during okay. that time. Um, he told you that um, the next day, the 19th, he was working on the bridge in Dubuque, right? He was working, yes. He worked till noon. Yes. And uh, they got rained out, right? Yes. So he went back to the hotel and he took a nap, right? Yes. And that he woke up to a friend calling uh, asking about where Molly's whereabouts were right yes okay um, do you recall saying to mr. Jack that every little detail that he could give you was important sounds like something I would say yes and, w and why is every little detail at that point important because we don't know what's important and what's not at that time is pretty early you asked mr. Jack to 
uh, tell you Molly's run routes. You recall that? Yes. And he told you very specifically that if Molly runs three miles, that she would start at the school, run down by the Jasper construction shop, over by Manats, and then back again, right? I remember, I don't remember Manats. Um, I remember him telling me that um, it was possible that she could run north on the gravel, 170th Street that runs from near near uh, that West Des Moines residence north. Um, she, she would run um, through town. One of the routes could take her by Jasper Construction and then possibly out 385th. I don't think Manatz was ever mentioned. But he had recollection, <coughs> clear recollection of her run routes, right? Yes. And it was Mr. Jack on the 20th of July, 2018, who told you her run routes. That's clear. Yes. And you asked Mr. Jack about uh, the possibility of Molly maybe having another guy, right? Yes. And that's just a routine question in any missing person. We had case. nothing to make us believe that. No. Um, do you recall Mr. Jack telling you toward the end of the interview that if it means it, it helps, he would answer any question, no matter how uncomfortable? I don't remember him saying that, but it's certainly possible. Okay. Toward the end of the interview, um, Mr. Jack mentioned some rumor he heard about some girl in an accident down by Pekin. Do you recall that? Yes. Did you ever investigate that rumor? I didn't. I don't. I think it was passed on into the, um, our little command post, but I don't remember doing anything with that personally. And for the record, he told you that he had heard a rumor that some girl and an unknown male had been in a car accident down by the small town of Pekin. Yes. And that a third party male had come, come upon the accident and the female had had injuries, right? That sounds familiar, yes. And the female looked at the third party male and said, I don't know who the other male is with me. Get me out of here. Objection. I don't Rose. recall that. Overruled. Correct? I don't remember the exact words. I remember asking him, trying to be polite, I remember asking him um, what exactly he, how that matched up with what we were doing. What he was telling me just didn't really seem, I wasn't trying to, I wasn't making the connection. If I remember correctly, he said he heard a rumor that um, uh, like a friend of a friend had been in an accident in some town 60 miles south of here. Um, she had been picked up by some guy she didn't know, and they kind of ended there, as I remember. Okay. Just kind of an albatross of a rumor. Yeah, we had, yeah, there was another piece of information that um, added to the stack, I guess. Yeah, that's true. Um, you authored some search warrants in this case, right? Yes. Um, and what were those search warrants for? Oh, I see. Um, See, I wrote a search warrant for, um, I'll probably miss some, um, Google location. Um, I wrote a search warrant for, I think, Mr. Rivera's trailer, um, his DNA. Um, there was a Nissan Ultima involved. I don't know, I think I did eight or nine. Um, I don't remember exactly all of them. Did you do a consent search of the Jack residence? Yes. Did you notice any firearms? No. I don't remember seeing any. Okay. You notice any knives? Mm, no, I don't remember. Okay. Nothing that stuck out. I mean, I Were got knives in my house too. Were you involved in the investigation of an individual named Andrew Day? No. Were you involved in the investigation of a man named Michael Davis? No. Were you involved in the investigation of a man named Brandon Roller? No. I'm going to butcher this name, but maybe you can help me. He's local. Yeah. 
Were you involved in the investigation of a man named Tim Tometich? I think it's Tomatich. Tomatich. I, yeah, I think I'm. A, I'm familiar with that. I didn't. I didn't follow up on that. Are you? It was followed up on. I didn't personally do it. Are you aware that these are all individuals who were investigated in connection with the disappearance of Molly Tippetts? Yes. Were you involved in the investigation of any of the employees of Blattner Energy? Yes. And just so the jury knows, Blattner Energy was the company erecting windmills in the Powashik County area. Yes. And what did that investigation entail? Uh, Blattner Energy at the time had what I guess I would call a big camp. Um, kind of near the interchange of 63, Highway 63 and Interstate 80. That's kind of their operation center they set up, kind of semi-temporarily, but they were there forever. So they had workers coming in from all over, all over the state and all over the region. Um, so as part of our canvassing efforts, we went there, I think twice, and interviewed as many of those employees as we could, or at least identified them. And the employees of Manatch, there were several of those that were investigated as well? I think we, we, I think we did a canvas at the Manatz, um headquarters in Brooklyn. I don't know if anybody was specifically investigated. How about Brandon Roller? Mm, I know the name, but I didn't personally follow up on that. But you were aware that he was someone who was investigated? Uh, yeah, the name's familiar to me for more than this, yeah. A local sex offender? I believe so. And that's why he was investigated? I assume so. A Curtis and Keaton Laver? Yes. They were also investigated? Yes. And why were they investigated? Um, let's see, I think we, uh, Agent Valletta and I talked to them the first day. And I don't know if that came in as a tip. Um, I think, I think we seized a computer from them that was searched and we interviewed the, the younger of the labor, like the son, um, he was eventually cleared. Speaking of computers, at the Jack home, when you went there, Molly had a computer? Yes. Was that searched? Uh, yes, I believe so. By whom? I think it was the FBI. Would it be? In your training, education, and experience, uh, basic investigative techniques to get all the information off that computer to see her activities in the days leading up to her disappearance? Yes. And if it wasn't, can you think of any reason why not? I don't know if it was, I, I guess I don't know. I don't know what was done with the computer exactly. Um, I know it was in my possession at one point I turned it over to the FBI and I don't, I didn't have anything to do with the computer after that. If it were your investigation that you were leading, what would you have done with that computer? Would you have had it examined? Yes. Forensically? Yes. That's all I have. State have any redirect? Yes, sir. Go ahead. Deputy Kivy, did you? Or were you aware of an interview <coughs> with the defendant that took place subsequent uh, to your encounter with him on August 16th? Yes. And when did that interview take place? It was on August 20th. And how was the defendant encountered on August 20th, 2018? Uh, we went to his place of employment at Yerby Farms. Um, to do a, I guess you'd call it a focused canvas to gain a little more information about him and the car and who else might be associated with him in the car. Um, at the end of that, at the end of that canvas, uh, he was taken to the sheriff's office for an interview. Did you personally go to Yerby Farms on August 20th? I did. Were there other law enforcement agents that went with you? Yes. Do you know how many? I don't know the number. Um, there was, I think, uh, myself, maybe one or two other deputies, uh, or DCI agents, um, Homeland Security, FBI, I think. I, I couldn't put a number on it. I Maybe 12, I don't know. 
And were you, or did you have any interaction with the defendant at Yerby Farms? Um, I identified him as the same gentleman that I saw in Malcolm. On August 16th? Yes, I didn't speak with him. I just, I positively identified him. And were you amer made aware that an interview with the defendant was taking place? Yes. And where were you during that interview? We had, after Mr. Rivera was transported away um, and we left the farm, um, I don't remember if I went down to the sheriff's office or if I went home. I ended up at home at some point. So at about nine o'clock that night, our chief deputy, Joel Vanderlees, called me at home and said, hey, they're still down here talking to Mr. Rivera. Um, he, he has some interesting things to say. You should probably come back here. So I did. Do you know what time you arrived at the sheriff's office? It was probably 10. And when did you leave the sheriff's office then after you first arrived? Uh, probably about 4.30 in the morning. Was that on August 21st? Yes. Where did you go once you left the sheriff's office? Uh, we ultimately ended up at uh, a field drive into a cornfield about four to 500 feet west of 2478 460th Avenue. Was anything found at that location? Yes. What? Uh, after a search of the cornfield, we found um, uh, human remains that appeared to be deliberately covered by corn stalks in a cornfield. Um, and those remains were eventually positively identified as Molly Tibbetts. Deputy Kibbe, I'd like to show you Exhibit 2 again. Okay. Yeah. You see an arrow with an address marked on the image? Yes. Does that accurately portray where the body was found? I believe so. And I'm going to move the cursor uh, to the location. Can you tell me if that's an accurate uh, spot where the body was found? Uh, so the arrow represents the address? The cursor. You see the little red yeah. dot? That's, yeah, that's, yeah, that's probably about right. I can't see the actual um, gravel road marker, but that's, uh, yeah, that's pretty close. I'd like to move to Exhibit 24. Okay. Are you familiar with this map? Yes. And can you describe what it is, please? It looks like basically the southern half of Powashi County. Are there markings on that image? Yes. And can you tell me the significance of the markings? Uh, the, uh, the little red pen marker looks like it represents 2478 460th Avenue, which looks like it's that yellow line, that um, um, horizontal yellow line. And the body location arrow shows about where the, uh, actually the little red cursor shows about where the body would have been found. The road that runs north and south directly to the uh, red pin, do you see that? Yes. What road is that? The Powersheek, Iowa Road. Is that the county line? Yes. Mr. Claver, let me just for clarification purposes just uh, inquire. You had referenced Exhibit 24, and we're looking at Exhibit 3. Uh, can you can you clarify that? For yes, me? Your Honor. I, 
had misspoke and I meant exhibit three, okay. which is what's pulled up on the screen. And, and that clarifies it. Thank you. Deputy Kimby, when you left the sheriff's office, did you drive to the cornfield at 2478 460th Avenue? Yes. Was anyone else in the vehicle with you? Yes. Who was that? Uh, I was driving. Officer Pamela Romero from the Iowa City Police Department was in the front seat. Uh, Mr. Rivera was in the back seat behind me. And Agent Potratz from the FBI was in the back seat with Mr. Rivera. Was it dark at that time? Yes. Do you recall the approximate time you arrived at the cornfield? It was five or a little after five a.m. Did any other law enforcement officers travel to the cornfield on, off of 460th Avenue? Yes. Do you know who that was? Uh, Sheriff Kriegel, uh, Agent Valletta, Chief Deputy Vanderleest, and Sergeant Jeff Fink from the Iowa City Police Department. Were you the first officer to discover the body? No. Do you know who was? I believe Agent Potratz was. From the time the defendant was transported to the sheriff's office on August 20th, 2018, to the time that the body was discovered on August 21st, 2018, were you aware of any other individuals that law enforcement interviewed during that time span? No. Other than the defendant? No. Were you aware of any admissions that the defendant made when he was at the cornfield off of 460th Avenue? Yes. When you were asked on cross-examination about several names that you encountered during the investigation, do you recall that? Yes. Uh, specifically, you were asked about a Wayne Cheney? Yes. Was any physical evidence uh, associated with Molly Tibbetts' disappearance or death uh, associated with Wayne Cheney? No. And what about uh, Mr. Pesca? No. In your investigation uh, concerning Molly Tibbetts' death uh, involved the investigation of several people, is that right? Yes. And among the people brought up by Mr. Freeze during his cross-examination, did you discover any evidence associating them with Molly Tibbetts' death or disappearance? No. Did you see any vehicle in the video, uh, surveillance video, around the time and date that Molly Tibbetts disappeared other than the defendant's uh, vehicle? I didn't. I'm sorry, did I hear the answer? I did not. I did not see any other vehicle. Nothing further, Your Honor. Does the defense have any recross? Did you ever find a murder weapon? No. And the body being found at 2478 460th, Mr. Pexa lived at 2410 460th, right? Right. After you found the body, did you think maybe to go knock on Mr. Pexa's door and follow up? No. That's all I have. Mr. Kleber, anything else for this witness? No, Your Honor. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Kimmy. You may step down and you're excused. Members of the jury, uh, we'll take a 10 minute recess at this time. I want to remind you of your uh, admonition. Uh, why don't you just for uh, clarification purposes uh, remain seated until Carrie tells you it's okay to leave and that should be just momentarily. 
Uh, and again, leave your notebooks where they are. Thank you.